I want to begin again by expressing my appreciation for the uh, tremendous assistance that the ABA has provided us as, as we have advanced this issue of the, the need for criminal justice reform uh, and in addition to the need for reform, the specific legislation that uh, uh, we put forward and appreciate the article that was uh, written uh, earlier uh, on this point by Bill Richardson and Janet Levine, uh, the chair of the criminal justice section and all the hard work that's been done by Steve Salzberg, Jack Hanna, Bruce Nicholson, and many others. And I would really be remiss in, in talking uh, on this issue about criminal justice reform if I did not mention the, the incredible heavy lift that uh, uh, one particular member of my staff, Doug Ierly, has made on this. And Doug, are you in the back of the room? Uh, uh, please uh, stand up. And, um, as, uh, as those who, who have worked with us know, I'm not on the Judiciary Committee. This, uh, the legislation that, we, uh, that we've been working on has been done uh, completely out of our office, uh, and it's, it's involved four and a half years of uh, really hard work by our staff, including meetings with uh, representatives of more than 100 different organizations across the country. And when we uh, introduced this legislation for a vote last week, which uh, we lost, as Steve mentioned, but we're not, we're not done. We had the, the support of 70 different organizations from across the philosophical spectrum. Uh, and, and it's a real rarity when you're working in this area of, of uh, criminal justice reform when you can put a piece of legislation up that has the endorsement of the National Sheriff's Association, the Inter International Association of Chiefs of Police, all the way across the spectrum to the, to the ACLU, the Sentencing Project. Uh, this is uh, something that is wide recognition in the country that need, needs to be addressed, and uh, we're going to continue to, uh, to work on that. i uh, also like, uh, uh, again, to, to mention I'm, I'm, I'm glad that my wife Hung was uh, able to be with us today. She's a Cornell lawyer, um, which, uh, you know, you're married to a Cornell lawyer and you're a Georgetown graduate. There's, uh, I have to say, I think, uh, I don't think she got better education than I do, but people light up when they hear Cornell, so there is a, <laughs> definitely uh, went to a, a very good uh, school, and I'm sitting here in the shadow of uh, Georgetown, where the years that I was at Georgetown, I don't know if there are any other people who, who graduated from Georgetown who are here uh, today. I see a couple of hands, Sir Richard Allen Gordon, the hairy hand and contracts, all these great memories, but uh, I got to Georgetown Law School right after the Watergate break-in in 1972, and I graduated right after the fall of South Vietnam in, in 1975. And if you were a, a Vietnam veteran, that was a, not a fun time to be in Washington, D.C. I will, I will say, I would, I, I've told people I'd rather spend three more years in Vietnam than go through three years a, again at Georgetown Law School during that period. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I want to talk to, to you today about why uh, I became so interested in this issue of criminal justice reform. What our journey uh, has been since, uh, since I announced for the Senate, I've been working on, on off and on in the area of uh, uh, criminal law for a long time as a journalist, as a, a pro bono attorney at one point. Uh, um, and what we did to prepare this legislation and what happened and what we're going to do. Because uh, what happened last week was a total surprise. Uh, when after four and a half years of work, and as Steve mentioned, bringing people in from all philosophical uh, viewpoints, listening to them, working across the aisle, um, adapting the legislation, just to, to be able to say, for the first time since 1965, we are going to get a top-to-bottom look at the, the, quite frankly, broken criminal justice system in the United States. We're going to get the best advice uh, from people who have spent their professional lives in this area. We're going to have them make recommendations to the Congress, and we're going to sit down and we're going to think about it. And we're going to try to adopt uh, uh, the types of measures that will allow the system to work again. That's, that was our objective. It was not a political. Uh, uh, it, was, it was not political at its base. It was, le it was a leadership-based effort. Um, one of the great things I learned 
from the Marine Corps uh, was that you have to have accountability in a system, but you, a system cannot function without fairness. You have to have both. And when I uh, decided to run for the Senate, I decided this is one issue I was going to put in front of uh, the people in Virginia, that on the one hand, we over-incarcerate. Uh, there's just no, there's no way around that. We have, by some statistics, 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. We have on any given day 7 million people involved in this process, as many people in this room uh, know full well. We have about 2.3 to 2.38 million people in uh, physical incarceration in one place or another. We have uh, another nearly 5 million under some sort of supervision uh, as a result of uh, the criminal justice system. And at the same time, if you take a poll uh, on any given day in the United States, two-thirds of the people in this country feel less safe than they did a year ago in their own communities. Uh, that's clear evidence that we've got a broken system. We're doing something wrong. Uh, when I first started talking about this uh, during my campaign in Virginia, my political advisors were pull pulling me aside and saying, you know, this is suicide. You, know, you don't talk about this in Virginia. Have you looked at the data? Have you looked at the, the political positions? But everywhere I went, when I would, when I would talk about this from, from uh, you know, the uh, relatively secure neighborhoods in Northern Virginia to some of the, the harder neighborhoods in the, in the Tidewater area or the, or the Norfolk area or in Richmond, people would start nodding. People understood. The average American understands the system is broken. It's not always fair and it's not doing what it was supposed to do. Um, so when I came to the Senate, even though I was not assigned to the Judiciary Committee, we just took this on. I was assigned on the Joint Economic Committee, which is a non-legislative committee, and I was uh, very lucky that at that time Chuck Schumer was the uh, chairman, and Chuck, Suver, Chuck Schumer's a pretty innovative fellow, as I think all of you know. So I said, uh, uh, Chuck, I'd like to hold some hearings on the economic consequences of mass incarceration. Uh, and about the economic consequences or the economic aspects of drugs policy. And he said, go to it. So we used the Joint Economic Committee to hold some, some really uh, important hearings that I, I think helped illuminate this issue and started a debate across the country about the, the fact that we need, to, we need to speak openly and we need to fix it. So I will say victory number one, and it is a victory uh, over the past five years of putting this issue up and causing people to talk about it is it's, it's put the issue of criminal justice reform into the national debate where people from all sides of the, of the political process can now openly talk about it without uh, fear of losing their careers or without having to worry about somebody saying, hey, you're just soft on crime or whatever. We've got uh, um, the Heritage Foundation talking about it. We have Newt Gingrich talking about it. We have uh, in endorsements, as I mentioned, uh, on this legislation from our three major uh, law enforcement associations, which were a little skeptical at the beginning when, when uh, we put the legislation forward. Um, I had firmly believed that if I applied the same leadership model on this legislation that I had used on uh, legislation that, that we put together for the GI Bill for our post 9-11 uh, military members that this would be a no-brainer, a no-brainer when it came to a vote. Uh, the level of debate was really high, the energy level was high, and all we're talking about is getting 14 of the brightest minds in criminal justice in, in the country to come together and give us advice. And you know, but we, the, the energy of the discussion was, was extremely high. What I did when uh, we put the GI Bill uh, into play, and, and by the way, uh, that was not an easy lift. You know, there, there are things that when they turn out right look simple in retrospect. When I introduced the GI Bill my first day in office, uh, having been a, as, 
as uh, Steve mentioned, having been a committee counsel in the House years ago working on veterans legislation every day, I basically, my point was, we keep saying this group of people are the next greatest generation. We're giving them a GI Bill that isn't even 14% of what the greatest generation got if you were going to go to a good school when you left the military. Let's give them the same educational opportunity as the people who came back from World War II. Pay their tuition, buy their books, give them a, month, give them a monthly stipend. Um, people were saying, welcome to the Senate. You've been here one week. Wait your turn. You know, everybody has some kind of a veteran's bill they want to put forward, and we said no. We developed a leadership model, reached across the aisle to the other side, uh, put this legislation forward with four principal sponsors, two Republican, two Democrat, uh, two World War II veterans, two Vietnam veterans. We had John Warner with us, my former senior senator. Uh, we had Chuck Hagel from Nebraska. Vietnam veteran, Republican, got Frank Lautenberg from New Jersey, World War II veteran, myself, Vietnam veteran, 16 months. We educated the Congress about why this was needed. Uh, we forced a vote, and, and after 16 months of, of effort focused on policy and not on politics, we passed the most uh, important piece of veterans legislation since World War II. Over the, op they don't like to hear this, but over the opposition of the, the Bush administration, we passed it. Uh, I thought, this is the way we need to get things done. We need to get people together who want to govern. We started the same process on this criminal justice reform bill. Um, but guess what? John Warner's gone. Chuck Hagel's gone. There's a lot that's changed uh, in the United States Congress and in the, uh, the top leadership of uh, our legislative bodies since the election of 2010. Let's just be very frank about that. Um, our legislation, this criminal justice legislation, uh, was developed hand in glove also with the House of Representatives. Um, and it's important to remember when, when we see what happened with this Republican filibuster uh, last week that in the last session of Congress, before those who were, were elected in 2010 took their seats, this bill, this criminal justice reform bill, passed the House of Representatives by a voice vote. It was not even con controversial enough to have to go under suspension of the rules to see if, if one-third of the House would object to it. Uh, Lamar Smith, who's the chairman now of the House Judiciary Committee, was a co-sponsor of this exact legislation. Um, we are not done, as you might imagine. Uh, we are going to continue to pursue ways to get this uh, commission uh, enacted and to get the advice and the debate that is needed in order to fix uh, the broken points in our criminal justice system so that we can again have a criminal justice system that holds people accountable where they need to be held accountable, uh, that uh, makes proper sense in terms of how people are, tri are tried, uh, how long their sentencing happens to be, and uh, let me just add a parenthesis on that point because I know it's something that's been discussed uh, today in your, in your uh, gatherings. I was the first American journalist allowed to go inside the Japanese prison system, 1983. I spent a month doing a piece on Americans in Japanese jails. It was fascinating. It was, it was uh, one of the inspirations that caused me to focus on, even then, on uh, uh, the broken points in, in our, the emerging broken points beginning in about 1980 in our criminal justice system. Uh, and in the Japanese system, um, if you are given a sentence of three years or more, you've really done something extremely unusual. They focus on accountability rather than the length of incarceration. Um, something we need to discuss, something we need to debate. Uh, what should uh, the standards be in terms of prison administration? Um, again, the Japanese system was very much like the American military. And what I, what I mean by that is, in order to be a turnkey in a prison in Japan, when I was, was uh, going through their system, you had to pass, you had to compete in a nationally, uh, nationally uh, standardized test. You had to go through a year of training. 
counseling, um, not simply uh, the physical part of it. Uh, and you could not be a warden in a Japanese jail if you didn't start as a turnkey. It was a promotional system that emphasized quality at the beginning and uh, measurement all the way through the system. And uh, I had a, an American who had been in Japanese prison and had been in American prison uh, who I had interviewed uh, before I went over there. And one of the things he said was, I shed more than one tear when I said goodbye to my guard. And I asked uh, one of the uh, wardens in Japan about, about his comment. And he said, if we are their comrade, we are their tutor, and we are their guard. Uh, so why don't we talk about, you know, there's good models and there's not so good models in the United States. What's wrong with having that discussion? And, how, and most importantly right now, and I, and I think that uh, the, the focus here is uh, that, uh, in your conference today is so vital on this point, is what are we going to do uh, in order to provide uh, smarter and better reentry programs for people after they have been incarcerated? As everyone in this room knows, when the magnitude of incarceration has increased, I'll give you one, one little key data point that we talk about a lot when we're talking about criminal justice in the, in, in the Senate. In 1980, there were 45,000 people in prison on drugs in the United States, 45,000. We got about 500,000 uh, in prison on drugs in the United States today. Basically, nonviolent uh, crime. Uh, but when you have such a large percentage of your population that has gone through uh, the prison environment. Um, it is in the interest of every uh, American that the reentry process be structured and as much as possible uh, be fair in order to allow people who have been in this process, those who want to uh, resume positive uh, career paths and contribute to uh, our society, to give them a structured opportunity in order to do that. I think it's one of the great failings in our system. And then finally, what are we doing, what are we going to do with the ever-growing issue of gangs in the United States, and particularly transnational uh, gangs? Um, uh, so much of it driven by incidents that are coming up from our southern border. Uh, the last number I saw was that there were at least 232 cities and towns in the United States where uh, Mexican drug cartels have been operating at one level or another. Uh, those of you who live in Northern Virginia are, I'm sure, aware of the, the growing problems of gangs in Northern Virginia. The last number I saw was there were about 6,000 gang members uh, in Northern Virginia. So we need a system where we need to revamp our system to where we can ensure accountability but also provide fairness and adaptive thought in terms of how we are handling the problems of society. That's basically, that's all we're trying to do. Uh, that's all we've been trying to do for the last four and a half years in terms of putting this commission online. And I, uh, again, like to express my appreciation for uh, your organization for the strong support and to give you my continued pledge that we're not giving up on this. I think this is one of the most vital issues in terms of how our society works. And we're going we're gonna to keep at it uh, uh, as long as we have the, the potential of getting this done. And I think we will get it done. Thank you very much. It's been good to be with you today. Thank you.